Which of these do I talk to? So I'm reading some selections from the brand new book, Member, which launches today, um, as far as I know. Uh, now, how do I summarize this book? I can't. This is what happens when a jackass tries to write sort of noir fiction. But, uh, uh, the premise of this book is, is, I'll try to sum it up as succinctly as I can. Um, the main character, his name is Thanks, and his, um, he's picked up a courier's bag, which has come into his possession. And this courier's bag belongs actually to an enormous intergalactic game called Chorn Sindantra. And by picking up this bag and taking possession of it, he's become a courier in this game, whether he likes it or not. And basically, he's trying to figure out whether he likes it or not. Uh, he knows, basically, that he's... Now, this game is very elaborate. It originates from outer space, and it involves all sorts of different people of different ranks. So you might hear references here to high rationals. The high rationals are the ones who run everything. They're the operationals. They're the ones who do all the hard work. Uh, and there are various other categories that you might run into. I'm just going to read you two excerpts because I don't want to kill us all with my with tedium. Um, <laughs> he's supposed to deliver this... Cur the, the bag is filled with spells and prizes. These things look like little hams or film canisters. They're in little tins. And they smell sort of funny and he, they make him feel intensely nauseous if he ever tries to fiddle with them. So he can't mess with them. He can only deliver them. He's supposed to deliver them to a big construction site, but he doesn't know which one. So he comes to this construction site, uh, one of them, and they're building this thing. See how much explanation I have to do? This is a pain in the ass. I should have just started from the beginning, but it's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> they're building something he called the artifact. It's just, it looks like the Great Wall of China. It just runs from horizon to horizon. It's huge. You can't see over the top of it. It's very, very, very big, and it's completely covered in tarps and scaffolding, so you can't see what it is. They've been working on it forever. No one knows what it's supposed to do. They just work on it. Huh. <laughs> That's it. Now, he spends a fair amount of time in the infirmary of this uh, construction site. And I'm going to start there with a little brief excerpt and then read you a slightly longer piece. So here we go. Slowly and very awkwardly, he shifts himself onto his side. Slowly, he reaches out his hand for the bed table. There's a roll of gauze standing there, like a little sentry. And he picks it up as carefully and reverently as if it were made of soap bubbles. There's intense expectation and longing in his eyes as he does this. Eventually, he peels off a length of bandage and, lifting his head with irregular little ratcheting motions, pulls the strip around his neck and settles it there. Then he reclines again in the sections. This is not the main character, by the way. Such wonderful, silky bandages, he murmurs lovingly, and right away bursts out, bandages, in a kind of gleeful, hissing explosion of syllables. Don't you think you're overdoing it a little, I ask? Mind your own beeswax, Buster, he creaks, sounding terribly ill all of a sudden. Being dead doesn't feel good. Raising his arm, he lovingly bandages an exposed bit of bony wrist and sighs softly with relief. It hurts? No, no, he croons. It's just my nerves are all wrong. I sit here asking them, his voice rises to a thin, plaintive wail of consternation. What do you think you're doing? What do you think you're doing? If I took these off, he says, lifting his eyes past them, this leg, he doesn't point, so I shouldn't have done that. His, this leg would be soaking in cold water, almost up to halfway the, up the calf. Above that is a strip of normal sensation that expands to a width of about two inches, and contracts to a width of about one inch minimum, irregularly. Above that, vertical stripes the same way, all around, up almost to the crotch. They alternate. One kind tingles like it's gone to sleep, and the other has this uh, minty, 
anti-mentholated heat. The other leg, the light from the doorway suddenly disappears, and he goes instantly silent. The woman who stood in the dark, this is a woman he's seen before, behind the man in the wheelchair yesterday, or whoever it was, marches into the infirmary. There's a white wooden chair in the aisle between the beds, and she all but obliviously walks against it, battering it aside with her knee so that it ends up tilted against the bedside like someone at prayer. If it hurt her, she doesn't show it. She's tall and rangy. Her hair is so pale it's almost white, a white crescent behind each ear. Her face is white, and her mouth is red, naturally red. She looks like Flannery O'Connor crossed with the bride of the monster. <laughs> Sweeping by, she doesn't so much as glance in my direction, but bears down on Jerky like a vulture, and he stares at her in a spasm of wild, naked fear. Stopping a little above the foot of the bed, she looms over him. If I were you, I'd stop wasting bandages! <laughs> she says hoarsely speaking directly into his upturned face. Eyes riveted to hers, he deforms, shrugs against the pillow, and makes a liquid sound in his mouth. She dips forward, reaching out her long, rubbery hands. He has time to whimper and squirm before she grabs his chest by the pajamas and bandages, lifting him up a little off the mattress. That's my advice, she kisses. The words seem to bore into him. He, his toes flick the sheets from underneath. The woman releases him disdainfully and turns to go, turning toward me rather than away from me. She has glass eyes. Both of them. Both of them are glass. They aren't fakes. They're unpainted globes of clear glass. I can see through them into her skull a smoky grayness almost indiscernibly outlined in red. Screwing up her face in a squint, she lumbers back out through the door, which hangs ajar. She doesn't raise her arm to push the door open, she just walks through it face first. So it swings back and claps violently against the outer wall of the bungalow. My roommate is lying as he fell when she released him, arms up above his head and his legs twisted, head in a crater, staring slack-jawed at the air below the ceiling. Who was that, I ask, just to make conversation? My sister, he croaks. The door sheepishly swings back into view and stops. You poor shit. <laughs> so, in this next bit, I want to cut a little to get it in time. Uh, yeah, it looks all right. Okay, so Thanks at one point makes the acquaintance of one of the operationals at the camp, and this man gives tours. He gives tours up the, he, he's, he acts as a guide and he leads people up the artifact. Uh, they're people who want to climb to the top, like climbing a mountain. And the artifact is, they want to be able to see on the other side, what's on the other side of the artifact and also just experience the weirdness up there. On top of that, the top of the artifact is supposedly occupied by strange sort of yeti-like creatures. These are sort of flying apes made of long black fibers, and they're called Wazo Li Ring. That's what they're known as colloquially, and these people want to see them. Possibly for some religious purpose. <laughs> so, like you do, you know, if that's going on, you want to go too, right? So, go to the top of the artifact. Uh, so, let's see, I think I have time to start about here. So, right, he gets up to the top of the artifact and he looks over the wall and sees a desert landscape of ridges and mesas streaming with smoke that forms into heavy colloidal ropes and globules of distinct colors while oozing swiftly along the ground. A palpitating ceiling of luminous blue clouds high over it all. One powerful wind crossing the world from my right to my left without ceasing. A plain populated by species of turbine vegetation that live by converting, not sunlight, 
put wind power into metabolic energy. <coughs> the ghosts of what looked like factories appear and disappear in the alterations of the smoke, colored in bands like the atmosphere of Jupiter. A voice shouts. Wooden faces, I think. That's one of the people he's with. It only takes me a moment to catch sight of them, them too. Black figures that, <coughs> lope, that lope along the brink. So far off, they're not much bigger than specks. But these specks not only move, they extend and recall distinct limbs. They flip up into the air and dive in sweeping curves from the edge of the artifact, while others come hurtling in on the fantastic wind and land with a sudden and total alteration of outline, bristling out instantly with a long comet fringe of filaments. I count seven, although they are constantly leaving, coming back, or being joined by new ones gathered on the part of the wall that must rest on rising ground relative to us. Wooden face and droop lip run past me, nearly knocking me down in their desperation as they rush in the direction of the creatures. The guide, his name is Eunice, passes me a moment later, as solid as a car passing in the street. As he goes by, he turns to me a face that looks like shiny seal skin and those weird, smoldering, ice cave eyes of his and says, give me a hand with them. All right, I'm grateful for something intelligible to do and I follow as best I can. But my own words, all right, strike me so funny that I can barely breathe. I'm laughing. The sound of my laughter, too, strikes me funny. This could go on all night. I don't much favor the idea of trying to tackle one or the other on those precarious heights up there. <coughs> Droop Lip is closest to me, or at least I suppose it's him, because his head is obscured by a black triangle with faintly glowing purple edges. And as he runs, the corners of the triangle are snorkeling out streams of smaller triangles or fish scales that rapidly fill the air all around me like the walls of a tent. Each triangle is sharp and distinct and framed in sizzling purple wire. Hold him, will you? Eunice shouts to me from somewhere. How am I supposed to find him in all these damn triangles? <laughs> it's like I have a thick fringe of electrified ivy hanging in front of my eyes. There are a few ragged parentheses shaped openings I can see through, and what I see through them is too close and confused to make out. There's the sole of a shoe, as the runner lifts his leg, There's the, that's a hand flashing back. Stop, stop, you're at the edge, Eunice bellows. I stop, and I'm going so fast that I bend forward at the waist, windmilling my arms. I can't tell if the warning was addressed to me or not, but Eunice wasn't turned away from me when he shouted it. And now I feel my momentum isn't quite persuaded to quit, so I bend my legs and fling myself backwards and land early, and the back of my head knocks against the artifact so hard my vision goes all white, then all black. I'm blinking and groaning, clutching at the back of my head. As I blink, the darkness in my eyes fizzles, and I can see the indigo of the sky over me again, veering drunkenly to and fro as I writhe in pain. The edge is close. I was running toward the triangles are beginning to creep in again around the rim of my sight, and they're smaller now than before. They bubble and spread across my field of vision like foam, each one clear and distinct. Off to my right, I can sort of make out, make out what must be down jacket, that's another one. <laughs> Crouched down very low. She's pulled this creature off her back, and now it lies supine in front of her. She's pulled its body cavity <coughs> open and is building something in it that looks like an armature of short needle-like thermometers, which are drawn from within the animal. The structure is now about two feet high, and she doesn't seem to be likely to stop. Looking at her, I notice that the triangles recede a bit when I blink, so I start blinking rapidly to keep them away. Rolling over onto my other side, I can see Eunice struggling with the two men. Wooden face is just breaking out of Eunice's grasp, and aims an inept punch at his head. His eyes are as brilliant as sunlit clouds and leave trails as he swings. Eunice evades the blow easily. The fist flies into space over Eunice's shoulder, the forearm only grazing his head. Eunice delivers a textbook uppercut with a hand like a rubber mallet. I watch wood Wooden Face's spirit leave his body, and he pancakes. Eunice turns to Droopy and wrestles him to the ground. Just leave us, Droop Drooplip is screaming. Just leave us here! carries on in this vein, 
while Eunice kneels on his back and binds his hand with a lengthy climbing rope. Even now, Eunice looks less angry than determined. If I lose you, I lose face. Ever think of that? Eunice collects the two of them and bears them off down the gravel slope toward the edge. I can't really move my head to follow them and lie on my side, cradling my ringing skull. The crunching of footsteps and the raking slides of stones drop away, and there's not much left but a rustle of wind. Far away, right before my eyes, the wazzly ring are throwing themselves in the brink like divers and then rising up again in pendulum swoops like kites, woolly black gorilla kites. No bigger than dots to me now. They do stately acrobatics that follow the contours of the lighter and darker patches in the azure dome of the sky. I notice that their blackness doesn't fade or take on any of the ambient hue, but keeps on looking felty and deep, even from this far away. When the wind shifts direction every now and then, a sonorous buzzing, like the rasp of a metal string, reaches me where I lie, still blinking back the triangle. They're going transparent now, like ice and ice water. One of the things is coming directly toward me now, right now. It comes in low over the top of the artifact, like a half-melted X with the head and the groin. Not 20 feet away, it abruptly arcs nearly straight up, making a harsh buzzing sound and sails over the void, dropping from sight nearly at once. Behind it trails a pungent chemical odor, which dissipates almost immediately. It's back, w above me now, well above me. Slowing down and speeding up like a roller coaster, it circles nearly overhead. The song wavers with its movements. It straightens its course and beelines back toward the others who are quitting the artifact in one shoal. I'm not on Earth. I feel empty. They've gone back to the landscape over there, where that huge, rotten, plant-headed embryo thing spins and gropes around. Every inch has its surveying corpse head on the horizon. Is this Earth? When did I leave? How long has it been? Rip Van Winkle ran off with the fairy nine-pin players and drank their speed of light drink, came back after hundreds of years. To what? There go the clouds. The colors dim out into the blue in a way the creatures never did. The triangles fill up my vision with scales that follow the contours of light and dark in the azure dome of the sky. Eventually, I find myself rolling over onto my stomach. I get up, not daring to turn my head, keeping it and my neck just where they are. No sign of anybody, not down jacket or butterball or any of the others. With great care, I settle myself perching on the edge of the wall, and slide off onto the heap of stones, tobogganing down to the floor of the trench on my ass. My neck jolts a few times and my head hurts, not my neck. There's a brief gap. For the past eight or nine hours now, I've been trying to cross the trench. No way to tell how long it has been. I find myself watching my own body from a distance, like it was a character in the film. There I am, half in a heap. Get up, dummy. Come on, get up, get up, dummy. The bag is still looped around my shoulder, but it swings wildly with my drunken swaying. If he drops that bag, I'll kill him. I snarl, so help me off, kill him if he drops it. My legs skid out from under me and I drop to the ground again. I end up perched on the far corner of my left hip. My legs have to be thrust forward and held together to ballast the rest of me. I look incredibly bad. My features have a dirt outline. There's dust in my hair. My lower lip is swollen. Maybe I hit it on something and failed to notice in the general festival of, in of injuries. Finally, I watch myself tip forward and music begins to play. The lights in the background begin to pulse and swim, and dancers of both sexes dressed in sparkling white tuxedos descend to the floor of the trench in files, chugging their arms like locomotive pistons. Oblivious to this, myself has gathered on folded knees and drops, droops, careful not to allow his tottering head to settle on the gravel, though he seems tempted. 
Don't do it, you bastard. You'll only drive bone fragments into your brain. That's messed up enough as it is. Your brain is broken already. <laughs> the eyes bug, and I only managed to catch a little mouthful I spit out behind the palm. It's a good thing that the dancers have on their roller skates. They're rolling around me now. Arms linked across shoulders in a series of nested orbits, smiling, gliding, and turning their heads this way and that. Through the music, someone cries, Chornson Don Tra. I jerk around and confront a severed head. Like you do. <laughs> Clamped between the hands, held high above the gushing stump, the open throat, the front rinsed with thick gore, the body engulfed to the waist in the top of the artifact. My body flails backwards in shock at the sight and lands on the back, jarring his head violently. He clutches the back of his skull in his hands, barking with pain. The dirt dancers encircle him. They pick him up. They carry him to the howling head. The body struggles, shouting with pain and fright. They dredge him in the flow of silvery mirage blood that spews from the now towering giant. A stream of black and silver mirage, boiling from red and gold robes and forming a stream of thick mirror froth. The last I see of him, myself that is, he is engulfed in blinding silver foam, a scream gurgling in his throat, staring pin pupil into the gush. And yet it goes on. There's another little gap. We okay on time? Maybe five minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm exhausted. I've never been so tired. I'm getting more tired with the effort of noticing how tired I am. I'm still covered in mirror mucus that hangs on me in heavy globs and smells like gray mustard. When I happen to look, I discover a scrap of paper curled into my left hand. Stay put. Getting the others down will come back. Eunice. That's peachy, I say, and haul out my trusty bandage box. After looping the gauze around my head a couple of times, I feel drastically better and manage to get on my feet. With my hips and knees locked under me for good measure. Since it's possible to walk, I make my way over to the far end of the trench. No sign of anyone. A nameless combination of weakness and residual vitality. That's what I've got. It's ridiculous to head over the scaffolded side now. In my condition, I'd never make it down a nice gradual ramp, let alone that popsicle stick highway. But I suppose being nearer to the path makes it easier for Eunice to retrieve me, assuming he comes back. Something yanks the strap of my bag and spins me around. I nearly lose my balance, but only near. And the movement whips the bag around behind me as well. Loring is already trying to circle back at me too, so I keep turning. Now Loring is a sort of fat, over, overweight, middle-aged man who keeps trying to take the bag away from me. And Loring has something to do with the game. No, I shout, like a man warning a dog. No! Loring doesn't say a word. He's breathing hard, his clothes are in shreds, and his eyes are locked on my bag. He swipes at it drunkenly, and when he darts in close, I can feel the heat roll from his body in waves. I'm getting ready to take a poke at him when a high voice breaks in on his voice. No interference with a courier! A luminous wand appears between us as we both start and turn. Both of us taken totally by surprise. I can't be sure, but I don't think I've ever met this particular old woman before, but uh, then they all look so much alike. This one wears the same tight-fitting velvety outfit the other ones were wearing. I'll explain that later. Something like a cross between a leotard and a Bo Brummel getup. You are a courier, Loring roars at her, and then flips his finger to me, and he's a fake! The old woman, having withdrawn her wand from between the two of us and folded her arms, gives Loring a look of withering disgust. With a long, thin finger, she taps her left biceps. If I squint, I can just manage to make out an even stripe of silver there, which is barely distinguishable from the fabric. Loring squints, too. Tears at the silver for a minute, then turns away, flapping his hands, his hands, really his whole body, in a childish display of frustration. Oh, umpires bureau! <laughs> he asks incredulously, now looking open-mouthed at the old woman. 
He stays that way for a few seconds before he adds petulantly, but you're outmoded. The Bureau's outmoded. Oh, that's pretty. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and early. Sigh of relief for just a room. When the old woman pointedly overlooks this compliment, Loring points at her arm. Your stripe, it's, it's all it's so old you can barely, it's all worn away. That, the old woman says, augmenting your dignity slightly by lowering her chin, only goes to show how long I have been in service. The stripes of the most senior counselors of the Bureau are completely worn away. That's how you know them. I wonder to myself if that means the messengers I've encountered in the past, these are all from Chorn Sandantra, have actually been umpires of the highest seniority. Maybe after all that service, they're so old they've forgotten everything. Perhaps they forget all the way back to the time when they were just starting out in service as messengers or bellhops or something. I mentioned bellhops service. And revert to their first duties. Then again, they may not need to remember. If they've been doing the same thing for such a long time that it all becomes a habit, the sort of thing you do with your spinal cord and not with your brain, then they might be perfect, perfect functionaries, unconsciously performing their duties the way a butterfly unconsciously pollinates flowers, or a tree unconsciously gives out oxygen. I'm thinking, well, for someone with a broken brain. And does this mean that Chornson Dantra has three sides, with one remaining neutral and observing the other two? Perhaps the audience for whom the game is played. Are the different sides on all, all on the same level, or is the umpire's like playing higher? Do they run the show? But if Loring's right, then the bureau is outmoded, and the umpires are just a bunch of superannuated flunkies who haven't accepted or noticed the changes that come with the passing of time. You heard the lady, Loring, I say. No fiddling with couriers. Will you shut up? Loring barks. The old woman's head lifts slightly as if I'd startled her. Then fixing me with a glare that tells me I shouldn't presume too much, she says with asperity, provided that courier is actively doing his duty. Is this proof enough? I shake the bag strap on my shoulder. There's probably a strap-shaped groove there by now. I'm still lugging this thing around. You tell me where I'm supposed to deliver it. That, the old woman says, is not my responsibility. Well, whose is it? Telling you that is also not my responsibility. <laughs> Do you know? She studies her fingernails nonchalantly. No. <laughs> that is to say, not particularly. It could be any one of a number of different persons, or it could be more than one. Well, how about some names? They would mean nothing to you. But if one says deliver here, and another says deliver there, two different places, who should I listen to? Both. She gives me a condescending look. You have more than one thing to deliver, don't you? Two claims on the same thing, I say. She shakes her head. Wouldn't happen. It has a violation. Will you pay attention to me? <laughs> Loring paces up and down impatiently during this exchange with his hands thrust straight down into his pockets, stealthily kicking at pebbles and giving vent to theatrical sighs of exasperation. So which one of them is wrong, I persist? <clears throat> the second one. So this is first come, first serve? It's the first claimant I should listen to, I ask hastily? The legitimate claimant. <laughs> Boredom creeps into the old woman's face. She pulls a thick yellow pad abruptly from her jacket, fills out a ticket and tears it off, presenting it to Lauren. Lauren <coughs> snatches the ticket surlily and crumples it into his inside jacket pocket, where thanks to a rent in the front of the jacket, it remains visible. Well, the old woman says crisply, I have to see to other infractions. Goodbye. So there's one copy of that book to sale. No, there's no oh. or five. Oh, oh, the there's only one, one oh. copy of Celebrate. Right. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, there we go. Come and buy the book. <laughs> and buy the one book of Celebrate. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you next month. Cool. Uh, that's great. <laughs>